Um, thank you very much. We'll have love to uh, continue with the poem, but the conference has to start about this time. Uh, Puerto Citoyen, poet of the city, it's uh, directed by Bankole Bello. There are actually two directors for the court that we're watching is by Bankole Bello. He was with us yesterday, and I thought that he would be here. I wanted to show this film to show the younger Polisho Inca. The film is actually available, but I advise you to get permission uh, before you can use it anywhere. But it's one of the documentaries on the uh, Polisho Inca. We are uh, seeking the permission to be able to uh, host it on the website so that you can also download it from there. Well, if you get it from somewhere else, I wouldn't know, but um, uh, we discovered it and we thought that it is something we should show on a spec day to show people how Wallisha Inca uh, started and all the journey that uh, the film is over one hour. Uh, so we are not able to program that because it might become to look uh, uh, boring, especially because of the poor network that we cleaned uh, since yesterday, uh, to which uh, uh, yesterday I was applauded just in profusely, and I was told by people that it is not necessary because uh, this is technology, and we know the challenges that we have all over the world about technology. One told me that even in the UK, they're having the same problem. So if we have the opportunity uh, within the next two days, we'll be able to bring that up. So I'm set for the conference. I've seen most of our speakers there. I've seen uh, Father Joseph Brown, who is giving the keynote. I've seen Professor Shegu Mojewuyi, who is uh, the moderator. And I've seen Nathan Kiwere, all the way from uh, Uganda. I've seen uh, uh, Dr. Lee Rong, uh, who gave the, uh, the keynote. She will be, maybe she will be participating in the uh, today. The other speaker, uh, she's in uh, France. She was with Freddy. Oh, Lucille, how are you? <laughs> I can see you there. Um, uh, I can see Professor Joey here already. Is the moderator. I can see Father Brown. I see Lucille. I see Veronique. Veronique, how are you? <laughs> nice to see you. I see Doctor Ndidi in one area. She said. I think we're complete except for Dave. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking for Dave. Let me check the other room, or what we call the Oza room. Uh, uh, it's not there yet, but I'm sure it's going to, it told us that it may be on the road. So I'm showing us. You are ready, I am ready uh, to come in the second session of the advocacy uh, conference that we're having. Yesterday, we had the advocacy uh, section. Today, we are having the symposium. And um, uh, I'll call on the, uh, the moderator who can then speak to all the speakers. Let's mention them by name. Uh, the theme for today is reimagining our world post-pandemic. And the moderator is uh, Professor Shegu Ojeuyi. Maybe I can quickly say it again that it's the Chair of the Theater Department at the Southern Illinois University. I'll try to put his profile here, but um, if, uh, while, while he's talking, I'll be putting his profile in the chat room so you can see the caliber of the person who is uh, moderating this, and then we we'll do that for the others. Professor Jewi, please. Uh, Professor um, Jewi is the moderator. Yeah. It's Thank you, morning Jewi. here, so I will say good okay. morning. <laughs> but um, I have, uh, it says I cannot start my video because the host has stopped it. I don't know why. Am I owing anyone? Well, you didn't pay for okay, it. Nah, so. I've, just been, I've just been given a visa to come on. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the time of the day is where you are. Um, let me first thank our speakers for agreeing to participate in this. Uh, it's a, a, a great uh, mark respect for Professor Shoinka and for our project. We had a wonderful session yesterday uh, exploring the subject of uh, I am because uh, you are. 
Now, today we continue our exploration of the uh, showing her ideal as a humanist, as an artist, as a social uh, justice activist, and um, a fond lover of wine and other things of life. Um, <laughs> Uh, before I introduce the speakers, let me just uh, give you uh, my own short book. Uh, the vision behind this venture of the thread path of activist honor that Shoinka has laid for our present and our future. Let's face it, even he did not or could not have seen how far his engagement life would have touched our individual collective humanity. So we set out to nurture a constant renewal creative imagination and to court inspiration from the pure truth of his enterprise. In 10 years, we have defied the odds and sincerely, we have now begun to create some fluency, some authentic storytelling that pierces the darkness and illuminates the complexities of our human spirit which seemingly is trapped in these failed nations of our time. We hope that in many ways we have shown how important it is to stand up boldly and doggedly, question the supremacy of idiocy and lunacy over our humanity, our nation, and our world. Let us bring the curtains down, but let us breathe with the power of truth and the ennobling consciousness that there is yet a new world beyond the pandemic a fresh birth, a renaissance humanity, an amazing promise of conquest ahead of us. Even behind our masks, like new age egungus, that's masquerades, let us confront this virus, this COVID of the cursed year of 2019 as a mere intermission. Let us now challenge the two paths laid out in front of us. One is of total annihilation, and the order of the great opportunity for new humanity. Let us admit that we have failed the great test of the first act. Yet, let us take the hands of our precursors in shame and self-awareness. Let us go to the mountain top where the Congress of Ancestors will guide us back to life and a renewal of no cheap feats. There is promise. There is yet a world to build and new lives to shape for the great future ahead. Why the intermission lasts and we change scenery and costumes and the plot is renewed for the reciprocal relationship between cultural practice and social reconstruction, let us recognize that only the brave and daring can overpower the decay that plagues our spirit. Come to this session. Uh, our key speaker this morning is... Thank you before we even start. And then the problem I see. One of the issues that I'm finding so aggravating in the United States right now is that people actually believe we should have monuments. I really don't care. Monuments are not stone. They are interesting artworks to get done. But the, but the monuments that so many people have demanded we tear down and at the same time the other side retain. Monuments to deception, lies, abuse, torture, suppressing. One of the things that I have found most distracting in all my years of solving activities are people tell us, well, you can't judge the past by the moral of the day. And the reason I have done my work over some years is that. I don't want to judge the past by the past. By the present. I want to judge the present by the past. In order to do that, we have to go back to the past and realize that the moral voice has always been sounded. And therefore, those people who are, so let's be quite honest about it, white, Protestant, Catholic, Etc. supremacists who came drain the life and culture of a continent to do that for the 
addiction to economic security we can never, ever be satisfied. They have always said, well, you can't judge us by your standards. The reason, this, the reason we celebrate this day of blessing, the birthday of Shoya, is that we can judge anybody because we have the authority of our experience and the authority of our experience is we have not been destroyed by systemic racism. We lost our determination to, as I say elsewhere, resist, persist, and transcend. I'm going to read a paragraph from one of the great texts of American history. There is the struggle for freedom of Black America. Vincent Harding, the author, talks about a slave ship, the young hero. And in this paragraph, there's so much that ties into what we heard today in the past. The men and women all danced separately on the stage ships. Their music supplied by a beat on a broken drum who beat on a broken drum or played on the upturned kettle, which was and continues to be so ubiquitous in our cultures. And what were the songs we sang? Who served on the English ship, young hero, probably spoke with great accent when he said, They sing, but not for their amusement. The captain ordered them to sing, and they sang songs of sorrow. Their sickness, fear of being beaten, their hunger, and the memory of their country, abused subjects. The limited night after the songs were over from the darkness of the lower back of the young hero and thousands of ships. The sailors could hear a direct quote and howling melancholy noise, expressive of extreme anguish. On one occasion, the doctor said that he asked a black female interpreter. All the words out. Pay attention to that. He asked his black female interpreter to go inquire the cause of a woman noise. According to the doctor, quote, she started belonging to the heavenly drift that they were in their own country and finding themselves awake in the the they dreamed of their home. All of black culture in the diaspora is based on dreaming of home. Continual perpetual exile from home does not mean that we have forgotten home. And for them to find and willing lot chain in the fill of the flagship. They dreamed in their dreams they were at peace. And in the main state they were in a nightmare. Tell me, my sisters and brothers, how is that any different from what we are facing on the planet today? But they made sounds. It always astonishes me whenever I read that passage. To know that, and we were chatting in the chat room for many languages. The show, you know, in the film, he talked about sometimes songs to me in Yoruba, sometimes it comes to me in English, and this, we had the multi Google culture came across the water. The slave owners, the traders, the ship's captain and crew. Provided ways to keep those people from talking with another. But they had sound. They performed a way to ameliorate the nightmare. And as I tell people, over and over and over, 
seeing as they were in their own field, when one or another of them were being sexually abused, male, female, child, adults, by the ship's captains and crews, when those people, after having been attempted to go from back into the mass, crying and weeping, and no one would touch them and hold them and, over and embrace them, they made sound that was comforting. And that is what we're doing in this international conference right now. Intercultural exchange. The brokenness was never fatal. It was never permanent. We have never been erased. I found this passage, one small speech from a play written by Star, I think we all know. The play is called Party's Harvest. Here is the speech. This is the last our feet shall touch together. We thought the tomb obeyed us to the soul. But the drums are newly shaped and stiff are strained on the stung throats. So delve with the left foot for ill luck. The left again for ill luck. Once with the left alone, but disaster is the only certainty we know. That is commentary, no question, and one part of Africa. But that is commentary on what happened to those three ships are in the holding pins before they put on those ships. places and Carrying all across the Atlantic, where they were broken to be more submissive, therefore more economically vital. So dance with a left good luck, and that's all again for disaster is the only certainty we know. Well, actually, it is not the only certainty we know. We know the sound of the howl, but we also know the articulation of the dream hole. And for this passage from one day to another, we must understand, and this is what I enables for this conference. The artist must be revolutionary, and every revolution led by artists. We act out, we perform, we sing. We do that which in my tradition is the ultimate act of power. And God allows our darkness and the acts. And God spoke. And it was night and day, land and sea, earth and heaven, the word changed everything. We celebrate that, but we also celebrate one other important point that I want to make today, because like I said, I exhaust myself quickly. The appropriation of culture. Is something that Mr. Powers talked about. Like students, they stole my song. We talk about it all the time in America. But that's all right. Because the greatest joy of accomplishment of any African artist, no matter where he or she is found, is that the real appropriation is to gather. All the elements that are necessary and nourishing and redemptive and liberating and put them into the tapestry that is unique to us. Take my rhythm. Still in the high dance way you do. Your dance to will be. Where? And to drum. 
Go ahead. So when we bring it back to us, we do it all over again. Now, here is the other issue. Every European scholar, theologian, economic exploiter told us what was true about us. I teach a course called Critical Issues. Here we are looking at lynching in the world, but now the revolution is that this, no matter how complicated and sometimes awkward the electronic world is, and I can see right now that you all are having problems with it. The victims are now speaking with the authority of our experience, and we are showing what has always been hidden in the darkness. We have now been called to claim our ancestral past, use our cultural gifts, and speak, as they have been saying forever, truth to power. For those who have held on to power as an addictive blanket are now being stripped naked by their own truth. And we are telling the truth. James Baldwin says it. The Negro, he says, having survived all sorts of terrible, terrible things, if he survives, and even if he does not survive it, something about himself in human life that no school on earth and indeed no church can teach, he achieves his own authority and that is unshakable. We honor Woleshoinka. We honor the cloud of witnesses, the gathering of the ancestors. We are instruments of survival and we are called now to heal this world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Brown. Um, the network was bad, and I'm, uh, I'm sure some of you must have experienced that uh, for the audio. And so I, I gave, uh, I allowed Father Brown uh, some extra minutes, you know, from the point where we could distinctly hear what um, he was presenting. Um, at the end of the session, when we come to the uh, Q&A and discussion uh, session, I'm going to call on him again, you know, to uh, kind of fill us up on some of the parts. And uh, I'm talking uh, for our attendees, uh, please ap I apologize, is the network. And I think um, the network is trying to survive under the pressure of COVID. So let's continue with, uh, uh, after that very uh, strong lead from Professor Brown, I'm now going to call on our next uh, speaker. And um, this is Mr. Dave's Goodza. Um, actually, it's Dr. Ndidi Waneri. Um, Dr. Ndidi Waneri has a master's degree in public policy from the George Washington University in Washington, DC, and a PhD in social and political philosophy from Loyola University, Chicago. And it is a public policy, social and international development consultant. She is on the executive board of International Development Ethics Association, IDEA, has worked and studied in the Americas, Europe and Africa. She has conducted research and taught courses in public policy, ethics, philosophy, international development, as well as business and military ethics at the university level. A current research interest includes the relationship between global existential threats, for instance, pandemics, global justice and equity, whether at the individual, social or global level. I consider, she says, all forms of injustice as crises that should be addressed urgently. 
believes that the greatest tool per persons have that in is, is their ability to think. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Ndidi Waneri. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. And um, so I'm trying to open up my um, presentation. If you'll just give me a minute. Okay, so my presentation is based on, around the theme of reimagining our humanity post pandemic. And uh, um, it is not going to be a direct response to the keynote speaker, but I just want to talk about the, the idea of Ubuntu is what I'd like to focus on. So one of the ways that we maintain psychic unity while exploiting others on any level, whether global, regional, national, or community, or even in our households, is to maintain the myth of ourselves as individual and independent. Then we come across a term, Ubuntu, I am because you are, a term that makes us feel good and warm all over. But um, sorry, I come bearing bad news. Ubuntu is how persons have always been. Therefore, to me, I am because you are, Ubuntu is a truism. Dictionary definition of a two, or dictionary definition of a truism is an undoubted or self-evident truth, especially one that is too obvious to mention. So to me, if you say Ubuntu, you're actually, it's like saying persons breathe, right? Because Ubuntu is the default. So let's carry out an, a mental experiment. Let us say you appeared in this world and there was no other person. So this is an experiment. Let's presume that you just, you know, you just show up, there's just you, only you. So let us presume that you miraculously survive into adulthood, just by the fact that you are in an earth that doesn't have any other person. So the question I have is, would you still be you as you understand yourself to be now? Would you be a human person? Can you tell me, of course, I'm going to be me, you know, maybe, maybe I won't have skyscrapers, but I'll still be myself. No, you will not be yourself because you would have, or you would have, if you're lucky to survive, basic abilities to eat, sleep, and defend yourself. You would have language, fashion, you will not switch fast music. You won't have the concept of time. You will not have the concept of God. You have a concept of real nothing. I'd like to check. Okay. Let me continue. So you will not be aware of some of the most basic things you now take for granted. For instance, combing your hair, nodding your head to mean yes, you will not have that. So if you will not have that, if you do not have that, would you still be a person? You might be a person, but certainly not the kind of person you are now. So the only path to personhood is through others. We all show up in this world a blank, clean slate, Human beings become persons because of what they directly or indirectly acquire or receive from other persons. Everything we are is the result of the past, present, and potential, that is future being of persons. A person can only be a person through other people. So why, do we, why are we now in a world where we have to repeat the truism of Ubuntu, as if it's a new discovery. It is because we live in a world we, where we seem to have forgotten that I am because others were, are, and will be. A society that chooses to remember the principle of Ubuntu is by definition a just society. Likewise, an unjust society is one that chooses to forget the principle of Ubuntu. Our current dog-eat-dog -dog world is the result of teaching and upholding principles that are come to Ubuntu. For instance, individuality, care only about yourself, 
hierarchy, strive to be superior to others, scarcity, there isn't enough to go around, so amass as much as possible. So we're visualizing a post-COVID humanity. So the theme of this presentation or on at least some of the following assumptions. The first is that majority of human majority of humanity are rational. The second is that most of us spend spend at some of our respective lockdown periods in reflection, and that those reflections led to thinking that prepared us to um, sorry, Father repent of our evil ways by working towards a better world for all, right? So, though, so if, we, if, we, if we have a, a conference that is themed around post-COVID humanity, it presumes some of these things that we've said, thinking about issues and we're ready to be better. So what is the past? As of, defend, as of December, 2019, difference, color, religion, national ethnic belonging, etc., was a major determinant to how we related to others. Second thing is that despite the rhetoric, we were increasingly exploiting and polluting the earth. We were producing and wasting more than we were utilizing. And this is key. We, pro we, we increase production, but we waste so much that we still have lack. In general, we bought into the myth of scarce resources in a world in which both global economic production and lack, as in poverty, were both growing simultaneously in tandem. Not only were we producing more, we were getting poorer, right? So what is the present? Near global lockdowns led to drastic reductions in global production, consumption, and pollution. Global solidarity displayed in the aftermath of some of the recent occurrences um, could become a global standard. We could be approaching a world of zero tolerance for injustice. These are the possibilities that the last few months have created for us. However, old habits die hard. I believe that COVID choked, but did not kill that, that, that refusal to accept that I am because you are. I don't think humanity has shed its collective skin and has emerged as post-COVID butterflies. No, I don't think so. I feel that the potential is there, but we have to realize what we gave up, what, what, where we are. So COVID lockdown caused us to conduct a social experiment that we could never have done, right? For instance, a lot of us, Okay, I won't pick up on any gender, but maybe some of us have realized that we don't need all the clothes in our wardrobe, right? Some of us have realized that we can actually live simple lives. Um, some of us have realized that solidarity is important, that we can't just sit by and watch injustice. But I don't feel that a post-COVID world, the type that we glimpsed, right? Reduced waste, reduced um, um, pollution, um, some of the things I've mentioned, I don't think it's automatic. It's not inevitable. We need to work on it. So in conclusion, a lockdown will give us a glimpse of what is possible. But, but, it also, but that glimpse creates a duty and responsibility to turning that vision into reality. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, Shegu, I'm done. No, you're mute. Can you hear me? You're mute. We can't hear you, Shegu. There is, um, now, can you hear me? Yes. There is a constant contest between my audio and some host somewhere that continues to uh, mute me. So um, you will pardon the delay. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Waneri. That was uh, quite stimulating. We've had two presentations now that uh, you know, have really set the cause of our discourse uh, uh, today. And uh, I can't wait to get to the end and then we start a robust you know, exchange. Uh, thank you so much. Now, I'm going to make a, a surprise call on the third speaker. Um, if you thought that you would be speaking according to how you were listed, and that was a myth that I am, I know. So I am going to call on um, Lucille, Miss Lucille Puget. That uh, last name is French, so I just pronounced it in my uh, most native Ikiru, you know, version. So if it works, it's fine. <laughs> uh, it, it's interesting that the last two, uh, the, that we had a, a speaker yesterday, Dr. Oyinson, who challenged the concept of I am because you are. And then today we have um, Dr. Nwaneri, who is doing uh, exactly the same, and but challenging us in a different way. Um, it's, it's interesting that these voices are coming uh, from um, African women. And that should tell you that traditionally, now and for the future, uh, African women have always been central to the uh, development of our unit as families, as communities, as, as, as nations. So if there's a renaissance coming, uh, please, we, you know, we look to uh, our women. I just, just a, a note there. So, and that was to give Lucille some time to, you know, to be ready. Um, let me find the... Please give me a second. Uh, well, I would just improvise. Um, German, can I have... Um, Okay, uh, this is, <laughs> uh, Lucille is a, is a journalist with a, a master's in uh, English literature, comparative English li literature, um, studied in, I cannot pronounce the school in, in France. Uh, she's coming to us from France uh, right now. Um, she's also uh, a keen, student of Wale Shoinka and in 2016 or so or 2014 she was a part of uh, an international conference on Wale Shoinka at the University of Lagos Nigeria. She's a journalist who works for a French public tv channel France, France Info. Um, she got a degree from the University of Ken. I hope I'm right. Uh, in English literature, <laughs> and uh, I'm now the master of journalism in France's oldest school of journalism, ESJ Paris. She was part of the Shoinka International Cultural Exchange in 2014. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome her uh, for her presentation. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Clearly. Okay, great. End. Yeah. Great, so thank you very much for that introduction and I'm very honored to be here today uh, thanks to you Shegun and Jaman. And as you said, six years ago I was in Nigeria to present my research on Wole Shoinka and so I'm so happy to be here today and to be able to share some thoughts with you and the amazing person that we just heard. Um, let me apologize for my English first because it's not as good as six years ago. Uh, but that being said, I'm going to humbly give you my thoughts on reimagining the world post-COVID-19. From my perspective as a journalist, as you said, working for a French TV channel. Indeed, after this first wave of the pandemic, and as a second one is threatening us here in Europe, some question must be addressed after experiencing quarantine. What kind of world do we want to live in? How do we want to work? How do we want to go to work? How do we consume? What about capitalism, econ ecology, economy, solidarity? And 
as a French journalist back in January with my colleagues, when we first heard about that weird, weird virus in China, we could not imagine what the world would experience a few months later. How could we? It was so far away. It was impossible to get here in France. And as French, we are proud people and we thought we would be stronger than that. And then it came rapidly to Italy, so at our doors. And at that point, we started to freak out and realize what was going on. Our correspondent in Italy was describing horrific situation across the country. And then we, we experienced that things too in France. Um, so France got the virus too. We experienced now more than a thousand deaths due to COVID-19. May they soul rest in peace of the one of those who died from this, the disease all across the world. So I experienced quarantine for myself for 14 days as well. And what I saw and experienced during those days and after shaped my vision of the world I want to live in after COVID-19. I've lived in the same building for six years and I... I'm a friend with my closest neighbor. Uh, they are an old couple from Serbia. And during that period, solidarity was the word that shaped our days. My neighbors were cooking for them and for me. I was grocery shopping for me and for them. We almost lived together and they were the only people I talked to and say for me. And globally in France during that time, what we saw emerging is a, a general sense of solidarity. As a journalist, I remember, I can remember the numerous reports we have made on initiative that were set up by association or normal citizens that set up actions for the neighborhood, for their community. And this is one of the most beautiful lessons I think we've learned from the pandemic. It's that when governments are failing to protect or organize solidarity for their citizens, people are doing it naturally. So we live in of dualities, of differences. And in this world, I think those dualities and differences are always highlighted. But in the bottom of our hearts, we know we are one. And we're not ready, I think, to let other or neighbors, our communities down. What I also noticed is that people were um, united with the medical staff in the hospital uh, in France. Maybe you have seen this on your TVs or on the internet, people were clapping at 8 p.m. every day, everywhere in France. Uh, I know they did it in uh, other countries too. And they also, in Paris, for example, some people let their apartment for free to the medical staff so that they could rest and stay somewhere close to the hospital they were working at. Taxis even offer free rides uh, for them to go to work. Restaurants started cooking amazing free meals for, for, for the medical staff so they could hold on. And then people got conscious about cashiers, garbage collectors, those people that were still working to make our life okay during quarantine, despite the risk that they were taking. Our president, Emmanuel Macron, even decided to give them a thousand, 1,000 euros as a reward. I don't know if it's enough. I don't know if they got it. But in a world post-COVID-19, I'd like to see these people get more money than the one that could stay at home safely. So I was really amazed by that sense of solidarity, of unity, because I don't think I've ever experienced it to that point in my whole life, and I'm 31. It's said that we need a pandemic uh, to feel and act that way. And in a world post-COVID-19, I'd love these feelings to be infused naturally among us every day. And may we raise our children that way. And what, what pleased me uh, is that idea of solidarity, I think it's asked uh, worldwidely, because it emerged in many essays that I had to read and that some of you presented. This idea of unity going beyond color, tribe, social status, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here it was to survive a pandemic, but it but may stays within us after that. The concept that I am because you are that uh, the other person was talking about. I think this is what we really experienced during the pandemic. We were united to protect each other. We stayed home to avoid the virus to spread and doing that, we protected each other. The last thing I want to talk about is how our global economic system is fragile. We thought that um, within a few days after countries decided quarantine, 
the stock exchange started to fail sharply everywhere. People who got unemployed companies and especially flying companies uh, bankrupted one after another. So economically, we all experienced reduction in the way we would consume or buy things, countries and company did too. And now they have to survive. And what they are doing is that, I think from what I understand, is that they are uh, trying to go back to where they were before, to the level they know before, but they cannot. So maybe they should try a new way of commercing. In French Guiana, the situation is bad. Everything is really expensive, food is rare, and people have no money. So in order to survive, they go back to the, the, the way of barter. I don't know if I'm pronouncing correctly. I'm sorry. And so barter is something I really like. I would love to experiment in this, in this new world I see post-COVID. We would exchange what we would know to do. So, for example, you know... Uh, how to repair a lamp and I know how to cook. It's not true, but imagine. And it makes you really happy to repair lamps and it makes me really happy to cook. So why should we bother go to work, to a work that doesn't make us happy uh, when you can repair my lamp and I can cook for you and we're both happy. This is the kind of world I, I dream of. And this is the world I would love to implant through my job as a journalist and through my children to come. And to conclude, as Jaman described earlier, Bolesho in Gaza, an officer of the officers, let us oppress those willing to enhance our differences, our duality, and let solidarity be the leader of all our action. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Uh, hello, hello. Yes. Hello. Please, all panelists have the right to unmute themselves. You have the unmute button in front of you. You have the right to mute and unmute yourself. Thank you. <laughs> um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Ah, thank you. Yes, we hear you. Go on. Okay. Um, thank you, Lucille. Um, that actually set us in a, in, in a, a right, different uh, direction. I, you know, quite enjoy the perspective, and you spoke uh, as a journalist. <laughs> compartmentalizing, Sorry. you know, the topics and uh, kind of broadening our minds from the just intellectual, you know, um, exploration into a world of reality. Um, thank you. So let's uh, move on uh, very uh, uh, quickly. Um, our next speaker is going to be uh, please give me a second. Uh, as I deal with um, the network, it uh, kind of upsets my rhythm. So the next speaker I'm going to call on is uh, Mr. Dave's Goodzar from Zimbabwe. Um, are you there? I see he is muted and he's... Um, He's also not on video, but I see he's, he's on. Yeah. Finally, somebody gave me permission to unmute myself. Exactly. That's <laughs> Welcome to my world. Uh, uh, do you have I, your video? Are I we... think somebody is it's also stopped. I think there is um, power dynamics here. So whoever is the host is the one that actually is supposed to be doing that because I... Yeah, and the host tells you, as he has done to me, that he is also not in control. Yeah, <laughs> maybe somewhere along the way, because I've tried to unmute this camera, this video. We can hear you. Uh, can everyone else hear him, please? 
So we will just start. Uh, you keep trying your book, but we'll start with uh, your when you are successful with the video we'll get to see your face because we want to see your face uh, but you see this is just a thing in this COVID times thank you very much, <laughs> thank okay. you very much. Uh, yeah. Dave's Godza is an actor director producer administrator and social justice activist Gotsa, in addition to directing and producing plays, films, and TV series, has starred in over 20 plays and 15 films. He's the founding artistic director of Rooftop Product Promotions based in Harare. Gotsa is a career, uh, in a career spanning over 35 years, has created unique theatrical styles that incorporate elements of activism civic education and dialogue. This style often culminates in a dialogue-based event designed to address political and social issues with indirect name and shame strategies. Name and, st and shame strategies. He constantly endures censorship, arrests, and intimidation from the nationalist regime due to his anti-establishment stand. He served as a regional coordinating director and board member of the Artists Trust of Southern Africa from 2000, 2009 to 2011. And in 2018, he was appointed chairman of the Pan-African Cultural Congress Bureau, five, a unit of the African Union. He also was board of the African Culture Fund as a member, he is an, an, an example of art intersecting with politics and governance. So it's my pleasure to bring on Mr. Dave Gutsa from Zimbabwe. Thank you very much for such a lengthy introduction. I am so sure German had something to do with that. You can actually literally discount the majority of the stuff that you have had there. But anyway. <laughs> Let me just continue. Um, I am because you are. For me, this particular um, statement, which captures our Ubuntu, is so true. It's so true because I'm going uh, to just a, just into... a second. We uh, some of us are seeing a blank screen here, when it's supposed to be screen sharing, so we cannot see you. We cannot see what is being shared. Ah. Good. Now it's on. Now it's on. Yeah, thank you. You can continue now. Ah, thank you. So I was saying, I am because you are. For me, it's, um, it resonates very much within my own personal experiences. In 1986, when I formed the institution that I lead today, it's also the same time that uh, Professor Wallace Oniga happened to have won the Nobel Prize. For, for, for literature. And as a young guy, I was then 19 years old. I was pretty ambitious. And I wrote to him a letter and uh, I invited him to Arare so that he could actually see me perform in one of his most dynamic plays, which is called The Trials of Brother Jero. He was uh, kind enough to respond. And I still treasure his response up to today. I still have read the letter, by the way, where he basically said, I wish I could, I could make it, but unfortunately, my schedule does not allow it. However, you may do your five performances without paying royalties to me. Wow. So for me, a 19-year-old who had just stumbled upon his work, because he had won the Nobel Prize. And his, his work also set the tone to start doing a lot of work written by my own people. So it, it, it really gave me that very warm, fuzzy feeling of experiencing Ubuntu in its truest sense. On that note, I would like to wish you, Prof. Sonika, a happy birthday, by the way, before I forget. So, 
Um, him having said quite a lot of the work that I was to find myself doing, moving on from Trouser Brother Jero to Mad Men and Specialist to a Play of Giants and to various other works that he had actually done, gave me hope, gave me a lot of hope in my own kind, gave me a lot of hope in humanity. Having been brought in so far remote from Harare, almost about 200 kilometers out of Harare, and knowing that the kind of I am because you are, in my own language, becomes Kandiro Kanoenda Kunoba Kanwe. So in Shona, and that is Shona. I started thinking, how can I share this um, very rare experience that had been awarded to me by one of our own luminaries? So I started doing a lot of work within various countries in the world, in, in, in Europe, in the Americas, in Asia, and within my own continent. But I was to be surprised by the on, on the very experiences that I've actually come across. For example, uh, having been trained in method acting, I suddenly realized <laughs> in one setting that, wow, all the stuff that I was actually witnessing in my village, especially in conversations or in rituals taking place within this, with the spirit mediums, was so akin to method acting in terms of style, in terms of the presentation. And I also realized that at funerals and at our weddings, everything else seemed to be quite similar. So the key question for me then became, why are we not sharing some of these unique experiences that we actually have as a people on the global scale? How can we push our voice within a global perspective and also be heard? However, in the context now of, um, of COVID-19, because I think that part sort of says something about how do we move forward? What is in post-pandemic? Yeah. A couple of weeks back, I shared with my good friend, German, and I said to German, you know, I'm actually stuck in some, re in, in, in some national park. And I was fascinated with the behavioral aspects of the various animals that I was with, from elephants to giraffes to lions, almost everything else. And it kind of made me think, here we are. We've gone fully back to factory settings. To factory settings in the sense that in Zimbabwe, we utilize, I'm sure like a lot of other African countries, we do utilize a lot of our totems. So my own totem is an elephant. And as an elephant, my own behavioral aspect in everyday life is motivated and is highly influenced by not just the movement, but especially the, 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 the whole entire relational component that an elephant would have with other animals. I hope I'm actually making sense. And um, as such, little did I realize until two weeks ago that the majority of the work that I actually do is so influenced by me observing and watching the behavioral patterns of almost every other animal that exists on our planet. And that has actually given credence to the majority to, to, to the work that I actually produce up to today. However, what was the key learning component to it? It just made me realize that we are all interconnected, extremely interconnected. Our entire ecosystem relies heavily on that which surrounds us, not just in terms of just the human population, but also in terms of just the nature and we owe it to ourselves to preserve. In my last point, my last point is, please let's move the slide. 
right. I'm going to talk about the value in this particular preservation that I've actually witnessed within animals and just ourselves in our own humanity, in our own bubble that we find ourselves in, in the COVID-19. And I'm going to share it in the context of the creative and cultural industries in, in Africa and what I believe we can possibly do to, to influence and reshape our world. With um, a young dynamic population with over 60% of our youth who are mostly now tech savvy, I started asking myself questions sort of say, how do we utilize our, our young people who are clearly walking a new path because there's a new wind that's blowing out there. So their love for the continent, the love for the creative and cultural industries is, is no longer in doubt, but the monetization is what's really in doubt. In the next two weeks, and this is where I want to tie down with I am because you are with our Ubuntu. In the next two weeks, we are going to be launching because we have influenced its creation. So we're going to be launching a platform, a platform that allows all of our creative and cultural industries to utilize for purposes of any from it. Because I've been more seized with all the various platforms that today, whether we are looking at YouTube, whether actually looking at Zoom right now, that we're actually using right now, or whether we're actually looking at um, Facebook or any of the other platforms, where we seem to be just throwing in a lot of our own creative content with z almost zero return. So I'm more concerned about how do we issues of copyright not so much infringed upon, and that the continent itself can the creators from the continent can harness and make a living from that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, it's um, first. It's uh, great to have um, uh, pro professors and journalists, and now in the realm of the arts, as uh, Dr. Brown just shared with all the panelists. Uh, all artists are revolutionaries. And so it's, uh, I could hear the undercurrent in uh, Dave's presentation. So I will move on now to our next speaker, who is Veronique, Dr. Veronique Messier, who teaches, um, again, another French name that um, I must have with just now. <laughs> You're fine. Well, it's been back time because they, you know people mess up my last name too. So, <laughs> um, Veronique uh, uh, teaches French language conversations and phonetics, as well as French and Francophone literatures and cultures at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Her teaching also includes courses on French literature in translation such as Masterpieces of French Literature and Women in French and Francophone Literatures. She earned her PhD in 20th century French literature from the Sorbonne University in Paris, France. Dr. Mazier's research interests of late have focused on Francophone and Anglophone Caribbean literatures, and more specifically on the presence of violence in Caribbean narratives. She has public, published book chapters and articles on Caribbean law and on the French Caribbean authors Giselle Pignot and Patrick Chamoiseau. Good. I'm doing good. In Nouvelle Etude Francophones, Journal of West Indian Literature and French Literature Studies. A monograph, Violence in Caribbean Literature Stories of Stones and Blood, was published in 2015 in the Lexington book series, After the Empire, the Francophone World and Postcolonial France. Uh, 
Dr. Mezier is a member of the College of Liberal Arts Council at uh, Southern Illinois University and is a, a vocal activist present um, in our internet lecture world. It's my pleasure to welcome Veronique uh, to our session. Thank you, Shagun. And uh, my apologies for all the French words you had to pronounce there. Um, <laughs> I'll come for some lessons. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for their invitation to participate in this conference. Uh, I am honored to be part of an event organized in the liberation of the life and work of writer and activist um, Ole Shoyinka. Uh, and I am happy to take part in a conversation around the subject of reimagining our world post COVID-19. In order to provide a little framework to my talk, I will start with a few words about that ambiguous post prefixed in post COVID-19. Uh, what does post COVID-19 mean? Does it mean picturing the world after we've made it to the other side of the pandemic? After we go back to our usual lives with the images of the crisis becoming more and more faint as they tend to do after even the most shocking natural or social result, uh, sorry, disaster. Or does post-COVID-19 in fact mean with COVID? Once we have accepted COVID as a long-term feature of our lives, something that is going to stay with us in one form or another for a long time. Does reimagining our world post-COVID mean picturing a world in which social distancing, facial mask, and constant precautions problem. Keeping these questions in mind, I would like to approach the topic with two different sets of remarks. First, I would like to talk as a concerned citizen uh, about COVID-19 as a disaster that is also a revelatory crisis. A crisis that creates a new world and therefore an opportunity to reimagine our world because of everything it is telling us about the old one. In this reflection, I am influenced by an article published by Dominican American writer, Runot Diaz in the Boston Review, an article written in May 2011 as a response to the uh, earthquake that took place in Haiti on January 12, 2010. In the case of Haiti, the earthquake as an apocalyptic event exposed societal problems that had long existed, but had remained for most of us out of sight, existing, I quote, behind veils of denials, says Diaz. One of the things often revealed by catastrophes is the conditions that were in place for that catastrophe to occur in the first place. If you think about it, not that much was required early on for COVID-19 to not become a global pandemic. Looking into the conditions that made COVID-19 possible brings up the questions of responsible leadership, of the crucial flow of information, and of the value of solidarity on a global scale. Yesterday, Dr. Oyin Tan pointed out in her important talk the necessity for a global Ubuntu, for a global recognition of the other's humanity in order to secure our humanity. I would like to mention the need for a global recognition of the other's health in order to secure our own health. I am healthy because or if you are healthy. COVID-19 makes visible the need for a globalized health approach, maybe a new and improved WHO, but an approach that would have two essential missions fight against the inequalities that are making health and life a class privilege rather than a human right, and provide a transparent 
fair and equal response to health crises around the world, as opposed to piecemeal decisions made by individual governments that are not always concerned with the population's best interests. It seems to me that the creation of a global health approach based on the values of leadership, information, and solidarity is increasingly becoming a question of global survival in our uncertain times. My second set of thoughts goes off in a completely different direction uh, and is literary oriented. As a student and teacher of literature and cinema, I have been thinking about COVID-19 as a new phenomenon, possibly as a new norm, that will or should logically have repercussions on literature and cinema for years to come. Confinement has meant for me, and I suspect for many people, watching way too much TV. While watching shows, I keep thinking about what I am watching, stuff that so many of us have always taken for granted, like people gathering in closed places, people meeting for a drink, sharing a car, hugging, kissing, is the kind of things that were filmed and were taking place pre-COVID. While watching shows, I keep thinking, well, you could not do that now. I am painfully aware that our reality is experiencing an apocalyptic event. Understandably, literature and cinema have not yet caught up with COVID. But I wonder how or when or when will cinema studios be able to make a movie or a series again? How will they be able to gather a whole bunch of people on a TV set in a studio? These are logistical questions. Perhaps the subject matter questions are more important. What are the movie directors going to film? What are the writers going to write? Will the post-COVID movies, series, novels, and plays keep presenting life and society as if there was no COVID around? Are they going to change and adapt to the COVID reality? Will they show and describe people's interaction dictated by the presence of COVID? Now imagine your favorite novel or your favorite movie rewritten post-COVID, or maybe rather with COVID. How much of the narrative of the picture has to change for it to make sense in a world that has to contend with COVID-19? I realize that my talk contains a lot more questions than information. I'm afraid I'm still processing the new reality and the impact that COVID-19 is currently having on our lives and on our world. I want to be hopeful that this pandemic will be a learning moment for humanity and that the lessons drawn from it will make us stronger and better. So to finish on a positive note, I will end with a quote from the article written by Mr. Diaz I mentioned earlier. I quote, after all, apocalypses like, sorry, apocalypses like the Haitian earthquake are not only catastrophes, they are also opportunities. Chances for us to see ourselves, to take responsibility for what we see, to change. One day, somewhere in the world, something terrible will happen. And for once, we won't look away, end quote. Something terrible has happened. Again, let us not look away. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, you know, uh, very succinct. And uh, of course, yeah, you raised a, a number of questions, but these are pertinent questions that we you know, must uh, contend with uh, from now and into the future. So I, I thank you for that presentation. 
Now I'm going to uh, move on to uh, our last speaker, but not the least, as they say, um, Nathan Kiwere. Uh, Nathan uh, has a bachelor's degree in industrial and fine arts from Makerere University, Kampala, Uganda. He studied film and, and uh, film festival and event management much well academy in Berlin and um, later enrolled for film production at the One Day Film Workshop in Nairobi. He has been fascinated with blending visual arts um, and audiovisual media over the years. His interests range. He has a series worked as program manager and later a director of Am Amakula Kampala International Film Festival, Uganda's oldest and premier social event until 2012. He wrote and directed his first short film, Missing in Berlin, 2013, shot mainly in the Berlin Metro and the snow-laden boulevards. Nathan is a founding director of Sword Entertainment Inc., Coronation Pictures, a content development and distribution company based in Kampala, Uganda. So we moved from, we moved from France uh, to the US and now we are in Kampala, Uganda. Welcome Nathan. And thank you for being part of this uh, session. Thank you so much, our host. I hope I'm audible enough. Yes, can see you, can hear you. Uh, good evening, everyone from Uganda. It is uh, 6 22 p.m. here. Good morning. It's not easy to be the last speaker in such events because you just feel like everyone has spoken whatever. Yeah, I was had. just I was just holding on so you could get some more sleep. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'll be really brief, um, reimagining our world post pandemic. Uh, let me share um, my screen. Can you see it? Yeah. All right. So, um, so speaking about reimagining our world post pandemic uh, from the point of view of a filmmaker and a writer, uh, first, I feel I need to make a, a caveat, put a caveat on, on that uh, phrase uh, based on the information that, uh, as you may all have had, um, when we talk about reimagining the world post-pandemic, some scientists have suggested that there may not be such a thing as post-pandemic because this virus may be here to stay just the same way as we have HIV, which came and stayed and other viruses, you know? So we might be, whereas we can imagine a world post-pandemic, maybe there will not be such a thing as post-pandemic. Maybe we have to deal with the world as it is for some years to come. I don't know. And then uh, speaking about uh, the, the, the world post-pandemic, also we need to realize that I think we would be painting, painting the world with a, a, a bold brush because um, this pandemic is affecting countries very in very different ways. Uh, we hear all the statistics coming in from the Americas, from Europe, uh, the new um, the new infections and the deaths, and indeed they are very harrowing. But I can tell you, here in Uganda, we have no more than one thousand two hundred, if we about ninety are already healed, cured, and uh, there is no death. So if the World Health Organization declared that there is no more uh, COVID nineteen in the world, I think. Uh, you, as Uganda, we'll be able to go back to our old lives quite easily. But I can't say the same for 
those in France or those in America or Brazil. So I'm a bit cautious. I have to use that phrase with some caution, uh, talking about post-pandemic and then uh, our world. That being said, um, there is no doubt that uh, the foundations of the status quo as we know, knew it have been shaken out of their joints and likely the world may never be able to go back to what it was before. That is a given, but what do we learn from that? I got an interesting uh, quote from an writer. His name is Arundati Roy, who wrote that the pand he wrote up there in, under the topic, the pandemic is a portal. And he says that historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is not different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And uh, going forward, I pose a question. What we experience someone called, uh, uh, let me see, James Russell, James Russell Lowell, who said that mishaps are like knives that either serve us or cut us as we grasp them either by the blade or by the handle. So the whole thing about mishap may actually be different to different people. So speaking from the point of view as a writer, I came across a statement that uh, global crises present global opportunities. So as a filmmaker and as a writer, what is going to be my new role in the new world post-pandemic as a narrator, as a documenter? How am I going to play to, to make sure that the events which are unfolding before me now can be preserved both in fiction because I see see a lot of and across the world and I find many opportunities of, of telling that story in a different way. The many things that are happening behind the scenes that cannot make it on the big screen, on the breaking news, not because they are not important, but because there is no journalist, there is no camera to capture that. Those stories are very, very many. To lose them because there was no one to to write a book about them. There was no one to shoot a film about them. So for me, the whole COVID-19 situation is redefining my role as a storyteller. And it's also showing me that as, as writers, as documenters, we, this is our time. This is our time to shine. This is our time to become relevant, to, to realign our, our relevance uh, to this world. And uh, uh, going forward, um, I, I was writing, I wrote a book which I had finished. It, it, it's titled Towards a New Pan-African Culture Order, the Mahmoud Afe Paradigm. Mahmoud Afe is a culture up in Mali. And uh, so we, we, we worked on a book together and I, I was using his, in Mali, a uh, festival, uh, festival Sule Niger, the, the festival on the, on the river Niger. Some of you may have heard about it, or you may have attended it. So I wrote that book, and we were supposed to have launched it in, uh, in April this year until COVID happened. And because of the many things that are changing, yesterday I wrote to him and I, and I asked him that, look, we, we, we are going to have to rewrite, we published and, and we launched it now, it will be completely obsolete. Because now things have changed. I hear from him that look, um, the way we so culture before is few is definitely going to be different. If I put that book out now, I would definitely be thinking about doing um, a second edition this very year. 
would you did it make sense to me so that spoke to, we are going to confront it to uh, to document this for both current and succeeding generations is really going to rest on the shoulders of documenters like you and i educators and and so on and uh, uh, i was looking at the situation some of the things that are going on in my country. Again, I want to use my country, Uganda, because I am very familiar with what's going on in our landscape. Uh, basically, two things because of time. I'm looking at how uh, things like uh, fintech, fintech, you, we all know fintech, uh, financial technology, how this is transforming uh, the, the financial landscape fi uh, financial and innovation and advancement in such a way that people are beginning to uh, in Uganda we have a popular uh, mobile cell we wait through your mobile phone Um, Nathan, you are frozen. Um, but um, it's a, we're about the end of your time, actually. Well, you will have uh, some time, some minutes uh, in the response session that we're going into now uh, to fill up the last part of your presentation. But I think we got, you know, uh, most of it, just about the last minute. So don't be too concerned that, you know, we didn't get that. And it was, uh, that's a full contribution and, uh, you know, a, a nice book ending to, you know, the presentations so far. Um, to, to our attendees, you would observe that uh, this session and the panel, and the panel is uh, a, a mix, a blend of ideas from divisions of society and our thought and our lives. That's the way we did you know, ideas and experiences in different parts of the world. Now, perhaps it's a benefit. is one of the opportunities presented to us by COVID that we could have uh, these conferences, uh, these sessions, without having to pack our bags, travel all the way, suffer through uh, airports, you know, and then and go present in a hurry and, and go back to no places. We can we can still interact and it's a bit you know intimate and we also intention part of the intention of the exchange that the world exchange the national cultural exchange is to have such platforms for cultural exchange and ideas just not the ideas but also create platforms for networking between you know our people and so for, to you all our panelists have never met um uh, they, ha they are speaking from different perspectives. They did not meet to discuss what we were going to present. So you had this, a rich plate of ideas and contributions um, uh, today. So now, we are will, uh, to a question and answer session. But before I do that, I promise to give uh, Dr. Brown, Professor Brown, uh, two minutes <laughs> um, to fill in on some of his thoughts that were suspended uh, in his first presentation. But since I don't really know what you didn't hear, I don't know what to say as a fill-in. That is true. So uh, just, uh, I can well, answer questions, and I have answered a couple in the chat room already. Um, my basic premise was this, that there is no past there's only present that keeps us in the forefront. And I was amazed at how many of the other panelists echoed things that I was saying, because what you just said is so true. We did not know each other. We do not know each other, but we're all talking in the very same conversation, which was my point. 
And the other major point I tried to make was that all of art is a revolutionary act. The whole notion of politics is someone stands in the space of the public space and calls strangers together by a sound, a word, a gesture, a performance. We create community. That is what theater does. That is what symphonies do. That is what drumming does in the middle of a village. We are all revolutionaries when we are acting out of our imagination. And right now in this world of virus, is safe, secure, and respectful for all. And we got to create that by dreaming it. Thank you. Um, I have uh, some comments here, and I'll just uh, uh, I'll read a couple of comments while I. This is from Julie Nemo to says that was Nin your quote there from you something terrible happened and we must not look away um a world post or with COVID presents the opportunity to be better well how do we grasp that opportunity while overcoming the many challenges diversity presents well that's a yes that's that's a very very good question um I think with time, with conversations, with dialogue, I think it's important, even if it's through Zoom, even if the network is not perfect, I think it's really important that we keep talking to other people so that we learn from their experiences so that we share our thoughts with them and they do the same thing. Uh, with patience, with compassion, it's with, with I think with compassion, mostly, right? Because understanding that we're not all facing the viruses in the same conditions, realizing that we're not facing this situation in the same conditions, and, and, and be open. I think Lucille was mentioning the idea of sharing. I do something for you, you do something for me. Uh, and, and we all work together towards trying to create a better world. Um, and, I know we always say things like that after a disaster, but I think what's different with this one is how global it is. It's not localized anymore. We're all affected by it. So I think that's different that maybe is gonna make this crisis different from the others. I'm hopeful that this is gonna be an eye opener for enough people that the conversation is gonna change and that things, good things are gonna happen from it. Thank you for the question. Thank you. There's a um, there's a question here, which I would uh, put to Dr. Waneri and Lucille. So we'll you know we'll go in that order. Says so first, I want to think, sincerely thank you for your spectacular presentations. Uh, we all dream for a better world where we will be more humane going forward from this pandemic. However, it is often said that history often repeats itself because we do not learn from it. How do you think we can ensure that this solidarity and unity continues even after the pandemic? Do you think the government or other social institutions may have a hand in ensuring that this humanity thrives among humans? Yes. Um, so let's start with Lucille, then I'll come to Dr. Waneri. Uh, thank you for the question. And if uh, what my answer would be, maybe it's time to stop counting on the, the government uh, because we saw what happened in some countries, they did not have the appropriate response. And I think if you embody- Oh, well, say uh, just, just uh, nail it on the head. From the United States, we didn't have the right response to, <laughs> to the pandemic. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but I think like a way to uh, to make sure that the this this idea of solidarity is going on, and that for once history doesn't re repeat itself, 
is that if you embody solidarity every day, even in small actions with anyone you encounter, then I don't know how to say that in English, but as snow, you know, like it's gonna the snowballs. Voila. <laughs> and and everyone will if, if everyone acts like that, then the whole world and so the government will have to <laughs> respond. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Wanner, do you, you want me to read the question again to just uh, yeah. no, it's fine. Okay, I'm fine. It, it, it's really interesting that Lucille said part of what I wanted to say. <laughs> one of the things I'd like to emphasize, no, seriously, I mean, one of the things I'd like to emphasize is we like to act as if the world just happened. People tend not to take responsibility for the world that we live in. We, we like to say, oh, you know, it's a doggy dog world. It's the kind of world we find ourselves. So I'm an academic. I keep hanging out with artists. Why? Because you see, artists don't have a choice. They have to be courageous. They have to take a stand. They can't hide behind their professions, their career. So a banker can lie all day with due respect to bankers. A lawyer can lie all day, but a genuine artist has to tell their truth from inside or else nobody is going to watch. Right. So there's something. So someone talked about the political side of um, of being an artist, how it's a call. Right. That an artist is a politician. I think it was um, Professor Brown that said that just yes, now. Yes. That an artist is a politician. So an artist is also fundamentally honest. That is why the artist that is part of the reason why the artist is such a threat. The appeal the artist has for me is that the artist is a politician who has to tell the truth by the nature of his or her work. We, we as non-artists have to begin to take responsibility for the world we live in. We created it. If we forget Ubuntu, we chose to forget it. So if we, cre if we live like Ubuntu, we choose to live it. Now, in, in the most advanced economies, and I use that phrase very carefully, it's loaded. So understand it academically. In the advanced economics, positive and negative, people are seeking community. Why? Community is who and what we are. We can deny it all we want. We can deny our humanity all we want, but it's going to jump up and bite us. In a crisis, it will come up. So there's an extent to which I disagree with some of the comments. No, we're not going back to something. We're, going, we're becoming what we have always been. Because what we have loaded ourselves with is false. That is the truth. However, there are certain things that, uh, recognizing your humanity denies me the psychic space to abuse you. I look into your face, I see a person, I can't abuse you. I can't take from, I have to share. I have to keep you alive. I can't build a skyscraper and keep you in a hut. So that denial of humanity is a prelude to oppression. And families, homes, state, countries, even generations, our nature, we, we pretend that our nature is to oppress. We pretend that our nature is to amass. On a certain level, we all know it's a lie. So the businessman goes out, he amasses, he oppresses, he comes home and he has to teach his children to share. He doesn't have a choice. So where's the lie and where's the truth? So I really do not believe that something profound has happened to us. No, I think we just painted ourselves into a corner and now we have to come out of it. Or else, you see that self-destruction that we've been postponing? We can't postpone it anymore. Sorry, bad news. <laughs> so COVID is a catalyst for, uh, you know, final, the final phase of our self-destruction yeah. or the beginning of our reinvention. Reversal. Well, it depends on if you're a pessimist or an optimist. I won't tell you what I am, but we'll see. <laughs> we will continue. We'll see what we choose. We'll but continue it's our to... choice. It didn't happen to us. We chose. It's a, whatever we decide, it's us. Nobody yes. should say it happened. It's us. We chose it. So we'll see what we choose. Uh, th thank you. And of course, you, you're right. We chose, uh, even if by design or accident, we chose uh, to make even the virus happen um, somehow. 
Uh, that question that you know you both just responded to was sent in by OK Emeka Ebubechi Daniel. And uh, uh, thank you. Now, Dr. Waneri, you just touched on the, on the artists again. And so I'm going to put the next question to um, Nathan and uh, Professor Brown. So we'll go with Nathan first. And the question is very simple. It just says, um, can you, exp you know, speak more on the notion of the artist as a revolutionary? Um, so let's let's go to Nathan first. Are you there? I think he's there. Uh, Dr. Brown. Yes. The all of art is revolutionary is what I brought up in my speech and what the previous speaker just yes. sprinkled stardust on. Sir. I have to use my imagination. As I teach, black culture is not about what was inflicted upon us. It was the fact that some, that our ancestors chose to survive, either remaining on that continent, faced with colonialism's worst nightmares, they chose to survive. And those who came across the middle passage, those who did not jump ship, believing that they could go back home but who landed here, they chose to survive by sound, act, learning a language that they turned around on their oppressors and used it as a way of, here's the song. I got shoes, you got shoes, all God's children got shoes. When I get to heaven, gonna put on my shoes and gonna walk all over God's heaven. As I have taught for years, People with no shoes who were naked so they could not escape slavery imagined a place where they could be clothed and shod and be free. And they never gave up. If heaven meant Cincinnati, Ohio, or Toronto, Canada, or back home, which some of them did do, they imagined something more than the prison that they were put into. They chose to survive by using the skills that were intuitive within them. Now, uh, still Professor Brown, um, now I'm going to pose this question to you, not just, not just as a, a professor, an academic, but also as a priest. Uh, what, is the, what is the spiritual journey that we, you know, are being challenged with um, through COVID and this uh, moment of shelter in place, in place, isolation, whatever you might call it. What spiritual journey uh, do you see us going through or you anticipate awaits us on the other end? To heal himself and find his new name. So I think the cross... you. Anyone else? <clears throat> um, there is a comment here, which I, you know, I will, I just Professor will Brown, Could I just say something in response to Professor Brown? Yes, please. What he said just now? Yes. Yes, so, go ahead. Um, so you just said that, you just said that there's a crossroads and um, the, the African-American community uh, I'm trying to understand that you're saying that they are the ones giving direction. Yes. They are the ones pointing the way yes. to the societies to go. The thing is, my question is then, you know, maybe I'm just not, maybe you're a theologian, you are more optimistic. I'm a more optimistic. How can Sorry. <laughs> How can you, where do you get the practice, right, to know where to go? I, I, let me try and articulate this. So I guess my question is this. A lot of, when, when faced with a crisis in today's world, we see it a lot, even in our aunts, our sisters, our moms, right? Um, people, once there's a crisis, they go and buy something. 
possession. It, it, it temporarily solves the problem of having to confront self. So I outsource looking at myself at looking at another item I bring home. It could be a car, it could be a bigger house, it could be a purse, it could be jewelry. We have become so, we're so good at averting our eyes that I think if, if we have never known how to be persons, how do you think that at crossroads we will take the, I guess that's where my pessimism is coming from. Well, I, my undergraduate degree was in philosophy, so we have a lot more in common than you think. <laughs> um, but I, I started off what I said with, I don't believe that we can wait for community to do it. Mm. Because you're always going to find in anybody's household, family, you're going to have siblings who do not agree. Mm -hmm. But as I understood the whole notion of Eshu as the deity of the crossroads, it was to ask, was to put so many tests and tricks upon the individual mm. that the individual might choose to be selfish or to be generous. Yes. To go in the direction of I am because you are, or it's on me and you better get out of my way. That sounds familiar. And that is the problem. So I'm not going to wait for a hundred people to join me at the crossroads. Hmm. I may have to get a stone, roll it over there and just sit there by myself. Hmm. But everybody who comes to me, I'm going to ask them the same question. Are you doing this in order to buy another car? Hmm. Or are you doing this so that people can walk together? I have got to ask those questions. And I am convinced that everyone who's participating in this conference, which has just given me such joy to be part of, we know what we're talking about. Now, is that enough? Well, Harriet Tubman was by herself and got managed to get a whole bunch of people from Maryland all the way up to Canada. Mm. John Brown only had about, what, nine associates when he went and took over Harper's Ferry. Nat mm. Turner didn't have that many people. Mm. I don't know how many people were visiting the island where Mandela was. Mm. But he was still able to be someone who said, what direction are you going in? And look at how he changed us all. Mm. So I'm looking at the people who actually are performing that activity. I'm not waiting for the people, the community to do it. Because my story, my, my brother who was 11 years older than me was a career criminal. A heroin addict for 37 years was in about five different maximum security prisons in this country, has the distinction of having been court-martialed by the Air Force and the Navy. We really are exceptional people in my fans. <laughs> oh, one, one, year, one year we were home for Christmas and my brother and I got a picture taken. And afterward, when it got developed, I showed it to my mother and I said, Mama, if you just looked at this picture, you would know who the junkie is and who the professor is. And she said, you know, baby, looks can't be deceiving. <laughs> you cannot, you could not expect anything less with such a, an exciting background. <laughs> and we now understand why Professor Brown became a priest. Um. <laughs> yes, because my family yeah. wanted me to be one. And my brother was an exemplary apostle of generosity the last 13 years of his life. And he had memorial services, two of them, standing room only, because the man was generous with everything he had, and people loved him. Because my mother always knew you're going to make the right choice if it's the last mm, thing. I you, do. Thank you. And when you are at the crossroad, now we hope we all will be making the right choices. You better. And as, and as uh, very brilliantly put, it, it starts from our, with our little acts of revolution or, or truth saying. Yes. You know, of just being uh, restless with what is and looking to the future. Um, it, that's a fine way to, uh, to wrap up this session is a testimony to the rigor of vision, critical thinking, and practical physical approaches that explore diverse cultural forms, historical traditions, and contemporary life 
And we are in true creative fortitude. This session, uh, which also plays on the ideals of, of the Nobel laureate, um, Wale Shoenka, <clears throat> uh, rejects the stagnation that precedes decadence. That's what I have gotten from your presentation. That in one, in one form or the other, we are all collectively begin to reject the stagnation that decadence, you know, that precedes decadence that we were looking at in our immediate future. So perhaps there's something to take away from the pandemic. We can see clearly a world beyond the pandemic, steeped in color and bold creative ideation, a world that fosters dialogue around the future. So, Professor Messier Veronique, Professor Brown, Dr. Nwaneri, uh, Dave Gutza and Nathaniel Iwere and Lucille Huguet, our panelists, thank you very much for this very exciting session. And to everyone, I say welcome to our future. Thank you. Thank you. And thank I you. hand it over back to Ajaman and Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, much. Uh, uh, Professor Jewi has given the uh, vote of thanks, but I must say that yesterday I thought we had the most riveting uh, presentations by uh, our speakers, led by uh, Professor uh, uh, Chinese, who is based in uh, is the director of the uh, French Cultural Center in uh, Chinese. I mean, the Chinese Cultural, Chinese Cultural Center in. Uh, at the San Diego University. But this session has been most engaging. And I like the way Professor Jewi brought in Bumi Oyinson, because it seemed as if Oyinson in the conversation. <laughs> I thought there's a coup going on somewhere. The way they were trying to dismantle the whole philosophy. And you um, say very much. Uh, I say that is my colleague because I'm also a journalist. <laughs> and Veronique, uh, the way Veronique came in, uh, you know, I mean, she expanded the whole thing around the different uh, contact, but I'll give it to them in the White House so that it doesn't come after it. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I know you are voting for, so I will. Okay. Please, <laughs> Mr. I think, I think, I think I'll shut you up now. Yes, please. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. This has been a most riveting uh, session. We're very happy. I want to assure everybody that we're recording. We're on Facebook and we're on YouTube. We're recording and the proceedings of this session will be uh, getting to everybody who has registered for this conference. Uh, an appeal to all our panelists, uh, the speakers, this will be an appeal to you that um, uh, the paper into something that we can harvest and publish as, uh, uh, into a book form. So to become something that we can use later. We will not put you under pressure, but we will give you the next uh, four months to do that. After all, you are in lockdown. So don't give me the excuse that you can't write it. You are all, did you, what are you saying? You're on lockdown, you can't do anything. You are talking up, about this home. comes up at the end, right? It didn't come up at the beginning. It comes up right at the end, right? Uh, <laughs> now you know. Now you know. You know that there's one industry that I run for four one nine. <laughs> it, it, it so shows up in different forms, and it sometimes it comes in the form of German. Professor, I have a T-shirt that says Professor. "Issue is not Satan." That's true. Professor Jewi, if you were not my senior in school, and if you were not my executive producer, I would just knock you off this screen. <laughs> but okay. I have, I have you muted know, you already. <laughs> God, no, you have no power. Only the technologies. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, happy that. Unfortunately, I couldn't get uh, Dr. Bank calling. To join us, even though it's in, it's in the Middle East of an African university now, uh, and marking. So he said he will not be able to do it. But yeah, a warm Ampa, who is also in the house, to be uh, the one that will 
I talk about uh, briefly about the film, and if he doesn't want to talk about the film, he will talk about the Wally Shrinka I know. So I want to go to the house now and ask just two people, what do you know about Wally Shrinka? The first person to show his hand is the one I'm going to call, and then I'll call the second person. What do you know about Wally Shrinka? Because that's what the film tried to uh, explain. Uh, okay, you know, let, let me do it this way. I'll call three people because I saw Professor Duro Oni, who you get our brochure, the many encounters he had with Shoka, and it's going to be in our brochure, which you can download and you see. So if Professor Oni is there, I'll ask him to speak on Shoka in one minute, which means two minutes. Professor Oni, please. I don't know how to spotlight you, but I'm going to make an attempt. Professor Oni, uh, okay, you can uh, talk now. Okay, thank please, you guys. very uh, much, Professor... German. Yeah, I'm sorry, Hi, let German, me just how are you? you. I'm fine, sir. Our executive producer of this with Professor Jerry of this project. I used to think that I was the one that could build a house in uh, three hours and bring it down in 10 minutes. But well, he always told me that he learned, he learned some tricks from Professor Duroni. Professor Duroni, until recently, was the deputy vice chancellor of the University of Lagos. I don't know why he didn't become the, maybe because he doesn't have enough money, but that's not why we're here. Professor Duroni, <laughs> please. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, German. Yes, sir. Uh, well, the first thing is uh, money is not involved when you want to be a vice chancellor of the University of Lagos. Okay. It's, uh, <laughs> that is a very well laid out uh, criteria. We give it our best shot. The moment uh, our current vice chancellor was appointed, we all congratulated him and we are working very well with him. Now, uh, Oga. I think the very first time I read his work must have been in Form 2 or Form 3 in secondary school. Of course, it wasn't any of the difficult ones. I think it was Class or Brother Jero. And it was a very fascinating uh, work for us. And then I was also particularly intrigued by the poem, Telephone Conversation. I just kept reading it and reading it and reading it. It was just something that I couldn't stop reading. Although some of my classmates in school and schoolmates thought it was a difficult poem, but somehow I could follow the flow of uh, the, the, the poem and I, I really enjoyed the reading it. But because I went to school in Kaduna and we used to have a lot of uh, sporting activities, we now went to the Kakuri prisons because they allowed them. It was like an open prison. So we went there sometime in 1968 or so. And then I asked one of the warders that were hanging around there and I said, uh, understand that you have uh, one of our, our guys here, you know, Professor Wale Shoenka, but I'd like to see him. Could he please arrange it? <laughs> he looked at me with such curiosity and he said that, uh, he was not allowed to see, to receive visitors. I'm like, ah, why would you lock up such a brilliant mind and you are not still telling us that you can't, you can't receive visitors? Anyway, in my own young uh, mind, I just thought, well, I'm sure that uh, he would come out and he would tell his stories. Of course, that story was uh, The Man Died, which also was my second encounter with uh, Professor Wale Shoenka. I think uh, there was a lecture in UI in 1972, and the title of the lecture was Showing Car, When Are You Coming Home? Uh, this was a lecture by this, uh, I think, the South African professor. And all of us were like, When would Showing Car come home? From where? From exile? But apparently, the, the work was on uh, when would Showing Car's writings come home to his own people? in Nigeria and not, you know, with all the big words and all the big grammar and all of that. But and I thought, well, maybe the professor needed a little more work and understand the background 
of uh, where we were in cars works were based. And that if one did that, then one would be able to understand the work very well. Well, I mean, showing card for us, I mean, that's really is a is a is a total inspiration. I mean, I'm 67 years old now, and with showing cars uh, the six, he probably could have been my father. So it's all respect very much and to revive him. I'm hoping that, of course, we would all be here for his 87th birthday, for his 88, 89, 98, and uh, perhaps also to 100. And if God allows a little more, then that would also be wonderful. I remember a television interview that uh, Professor Wolesho Inka gave to some lady in Badon. And the lady kept saying, look, how come you are looking like this, sir? You know, you're so young, you look fresh, you're... Uh, Wasi Karim, I know he's stuck somewhere in the United Kingdom, but uh, we wish him a safe journey back after the COVID. But it's interesting that Nigerian theater is also coming up gradually. There are some dramas. Now, the last one was uh, uh, theater in the car or something. That was performance. Yeah, in, in the uh, car. Uh, yeah, you open there. Yeah. The driving the park, the open drama. And they said, you know, that... Uh, you know, they were able to show the production. People sat in their cars and they put the audio through their radio channels. That's very innovative. And we like to really congratulate all those who are involved in that. Thank you very much, German. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad that you raised that because uh, I, I sat in a session with Teju Karim, who is also a technical, I mean, of course, Teju Karim, is always giving credit to you as one of the people that um, I worked with that has inspired him. And uh, we, we knew that he came back from London and he started a new direction for the thing. He said that this is the time for technical theater artists to put their heads together. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that he'll be contacting you very soon because our life should not stop because of uh, COVID, because of pan pandemic. And the reason we're doing this is to just to assure people that um, our life will continue. Our humanity will be restored to sanity and our world will be healed. COVID will go away. We didn't manufacture it. We didn't invite him, our, him, her, it. It just snaked on on us. It will snake out. I'm actually consulting my grandfather who is uh, Babala please, Babala Kwete, and he has assured me that uh, COVID is already packing his load. Uh, what else do I have to say that, that Oli Ade, Chef Gandhi Fila, has actually warned COVID. We don't pack your load and leave, we will send you packing. Thank you very much, Professor Duroni. Uh, I'd like thank to- you, uh, th th Thank you, Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, with what you have said, I'm inspired now to ask, uh, I wanted to ask questions from young people, but I don't know who is young. They're John Kolade, Onye Dikachi, Eze, Ade Dolakpo, Ade Kiton, Emilola Akano. Who is a young person there? Who will tell me that I'm young? I love more dear. I want a young person. I just want to ask you a question. Who do you, what do you know about Wally Shoenka? Apart from what oh, Professor yes. Duroni has said. Uh, so, is there a way that? that okay? I don't know how to open my video. Yeah, go on. I can't see the option on my video. I can't see the option for it. Yes. I, I I can only see audio. Okay, uh, you know, you can speak. We can't see you, but you can talk. Your voice is more important. Okay, um, I want to ask, which I, um, what was the question? Because I've been raising my hand since, so I don't even know what I was called for anymore. Uh, let me say that uh, Tammy Lola has been very active in the chat room. Thank you, sir. We just want you to um, share some of your thoughts uh, with us. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. My name is Akon Timela. I am 13 year old and I am a JSS3 student. So, um, 
based on what Dr. Nwan Neri said, I'm so sorry if I did not get her name properly. I don't really know how to pronounce it. But I believe that she said that Mission, according to what I, I understood from what she said. Yes, now. Yes. Um, I'm hearing somebody else's voice. I don't I don't know where it's coming from. You know, you know, you know what we're going to do. We're going to do this, and I'm sorry if it appears uh, rough. I'm going to mute every other person so that only the person who is talking can talk, because there are so many background noise and we're not hearing ourselves. So, Emilola Akano, you have the floor. We are going to mute every other person. Please. Yes, sir. Thank you, right. sir. So, um, as I was saying. From what Dr. Umwaneri said, she said that the theory of Ubuntu has been in existence since, but it is, we are all acting like it's a new thing because based on what I understood from what she said, I stand corrected. She said that we are who we are today because of the experiences that people have put us through. For example, uh, I'm sure that if somebody did not teach me that my left hand was my right hand, I would not know, which I think that's what I got from what she said. But I believe that according to the way the society is, although Ubuntu has been, has been, has been in process since, I believe that it hasn't truly been enforced. What is my reason of saying this? So basically, Ubuntu is surrounded on humanity. It's based on humanity, but what exactly have ha, has <laughs> has humanity done? My question is that with the world today, there's a lot of greed, there's a lot of suffering, there's a lot of terrible, terrible things going on in the world today, and I have no idea who exactly is wanting to make a change. What am I saying? I, I'm, what I'm simply saying is that I'm waiting for the day that somebody can truly say I am because you are for example like if a person is talking about what they have achieved about what they are able to do today can this person truly say that I know all these things today because so 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 and so person helped me out when I was in need that's the way I've been seeing it although I saw it from a different perspective when Dr. Nwanwari said when she spoke today I also saw it from the perspective that she was coming from but another perspective that we can look at it from is that which day exactly would somebody great be able to come and stand in front of the world and say, I am the doctor I am today, or I am the today, or I am the person in general that I am today. Because when I was younger or last year or last two years, so 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 and so person gave me money when I needed it. So 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 and so person gave me healthcare when I needed it. So 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 and so person cared for me um, can i can uh, people hello. still hear me well we're hearing you hello. but um yeah we're hearing you but let me uh because uh, you are taking us back to the session i'm that done just... i'm done okay so what i'm going to say is that go to the chat room and send a question uh on the one you can engage you. her you can hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, please. Send a message to uh, Father Brown was doing something when we were going on. He kept on responding to people. People were asking him questions and he was responding to them. All this thing has been invested and we're going to publish them in a book. But we are in another session now. So our advice with Emilola send your question, just go to the chat room, look for the name of Dr. Nwaneri and send your question to her. She'll send you, she'll answer you. And then you can even have, can develop a relationship where you can debrief her properly. I, I know her very well, she's a teacher too. So she'll be able to engage with you. I'm, I'm sorry that we missed you in the, uh, we missed ask, uh, taking your question in the conference room, but she she will be very ready to do that because now when and I would, I would like to respect that because some people are here because of the film they're here because we're also celebrating and I can see Dr. Ndidinwani is still in the house 
should be able to attend to you. Uh, what I would like to do now is to, uh, I wanted to get people who can ask questions about, I was asking young people, what do you know about Shoenka? If there's anyone who just want to say, say this is what I know about Shoenka, then I'll bring in Professor Awam Ampa, who I mentioned being the longest aide of uh, Professor uh, Wally Shoenka, uh, to give us an intro and then we show the film. The film will answer some questions about Wally Shoenka. Even for me, I got to know Shoenka better through the, the, the film. Uh, Mini mini mani mo, mini mini mani mo. Between Anila, Adi Dolakpo, Ibu Bichuku, John Koladi, Adi Alao. Who should I call? Okay. Let me give it to Anila Modia because that hand has been obsessed. Anila Modia, please. Good day, sir. Thank you. Yeah, you good welcome. evening, sir. Yeah, good you're welcome. Evening, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, my name is Margia yeah, sure. from Lagos, Nigeria, and, and I, I got to know about this um conference from um your WhatsApp actually. Um, looking at the way Wale Shoinka has been improving us, he has been improving us in a way that is so unimaginable. When I read about his um life history, his biography, I noticed that he has always stood up for what is right. Apart from being a writer, he had always stood up for what is right by um, writing and speaking up. I remember in 1967 when the civil war and so many other things occurred in Nigeria, he, he if I can remember well, he wrote an article to cease fire, yeah, to cease fire rather. So whites are affected. Um, Browns are affected, and so many other people. So it it boils down to that anti-racism fight. Everybody is the same. We are one and the same, no matter what this virus is affecting everybody. So this it has exposed us to in the world. This COVID nineteen has exposed us to is that we are nothing. Everybody is just struggling to be something, but then we are nothing because a little virus that we can't even see has has disrupted the whole world. So um, the post-pandemic world will be a very better world because everybody has learned one lesson or the other. So um, Wale Shoika is a yes. yeah. Although I'm from Abe Okuta also. So <laughs> that's uh, really, really amazing because I, I, I am from Abe Okuta. I'm, I'm an Egba, Egba girl. You know, so, <laughs> now I see that you are, you are biased. All those people from Abe Okuta, Abe Okuta is... Uh, the first Nigerian to get the Nobel Prize. And he led the group called Pirates, which was actually meant to influence the world, mostly Nigeria, just to create a very good view of what Ubuntu said, I am because you are. So all he just wanted to do was to show us that we need each other to be ourselves, like, for you to exist, I have to exist. Pending. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Just want to be brief. For making it so brief, uh, you're right. You're right. Uh, Shoenka, the way we define him is that he's a global humanist. Global humanist. He's a global citizen. He's, um, uh, it's, it's the pride of Africa and the pride of humanity. Uh, because that's the question the young people are asking. One of them said uh, that it's, it's fixed for the nation. And one of them said, okay, it's a humanist. So we can, I'm, I'm sure you can put these two together. And then that will lead us to the film. We show, we show you. Um, contributing and being a part of celebrating uh, Professor Wale Shoinka. Um, it's very unfair to even ask me to talk about Professor Shoinka in a few minutes. Uh, people write acres of books, lots of dissertations have been written, and there's just no way you could summarize it. And I think nothing will please Professor Shoinka more than hearing the very young people actually understand his significance. His significance not like um, any of the leaders in the country today, but really his significance as a humanist 
who believes that you have to be an activist in your environment in order to make meaning of life. And it's impressive that these young people are able to read, understand, and also even if they don't, can't read his poems and his plays, at least they can see his images and political and cultural activism. And that is um, what I'm sure Professor Shoenka uh, would rather happen. But Professor Shoenka belongs to the world. He does not in Nigeria. Uh, Professor Shoenka, as the film shortly will show, the film in English is called, it, the, the title of the film in English will be A Poet of the World. And that's precisely, but the world that Professor Shoinka is talking about starts from where he was at in Nigeria. And it, it, it's an expansive way of teaching, of, of talking about the world where it's not simply a local corner, but that everything we do think and say and imagine belongs to a global landscape. And he's written too many things for, uh, for us to even think about. He's written, he's done plays, he's done poetry, he's done music, he's done so many other things that we can't even begin to mention. Um, uh, but let me first of all raise a toast to him with the most appropriate lib uh, um, libation to what um, I would rather, I've written this somewhere else that with the fiercest of thoughts, fire of words, clarity of focus, there are only a few like him who are as consistent and consistently charged with addressing issues of social inequality. With the kind of cultural and political activism he has mapped out not only for himself, but for people around the world and for multiple generations of his students. I am but one of um, thousands, several hundreds of his former students around the world but for, for Professor Shoenka, it's not only oh, those, yeah. it's not only those he encountered in the classroom, but it was also those who's, who he inspired in different parts of Nigeria and the rest of the world. Um, this poet, this dramatist, this philosopher, this teacher, this polymath, who we will loosely call a supreme admiral of multiple fleets, um, 86 chairs, uh, to continuous thunder. And um, he has built many monuments in many of us. And I hope those younger people who continue <clears throat> to be inspired by him, continue to learn more about him. This film is just an hour introduction to the multifaceted man. Uh, the, the, what it tells you, bottom line, is that Professor Shoenka lives in multiple times and multiple places simultaneously. So the film shows him comfortable in the world of tradition as he is in the world of the modern day. But as somebody who is constantly creative and always building and reinventing things, which is the energy he wants to impart to his audiences, to his students, and to the younger generation. Um, uh, the, the film uh, talks about his idea of humanism. Humanism, you can call it Ubuntu, you can call it any other name. Humanism is not complicated. It's not complicated to not see yourself as the center of the world, but to understand that there are many centers to the world and that we are interdependent and our subjectivity is what makes us the subjects of history. And there's no better person than Professor Shoenka to exemplify that. But this film is done poetically, it's done with a lot of footage. And also for me, it's a great pride to be able to introduce the film because uh, the co-director of the film, uh, uh, Dr. Bancoli Bello, was actually my teacher at IFE as well. So I am so pleased. I was so happy to see and dis rediscover this film. And um, to this occupant of multiple places and multiple times called Professor Ole Shoenka, this film gives you a little introduction to it. And for the young people, if you haven't seen it, go online and check his poem about children called As If. And there you would understand that he's giving you an attitude, he's giving you a kernel of truth so that you will not accept 
the, the tyrannies of those around you, your parents, your grandparents, and the people they support, you will not accept the untruths they teach you every day, but rather you would actually be an activist yourself in your mind and in your way you see the world. The world is absolutely changeable and you are going to be one of those who change it. And this is to the younger people and to the rest of us, we will say cheers to Professor Shoinka. Thank you, German. Thank you, uh, and thank you to all the others who have put this event together, regardless of the situation. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, the film will be screening now, and uh, the executive producer who is directing the film has told me to screen this film to the full, because after that, we're going to have uh, the, uh, the Strong Bridge, another play by Oli Shoenka, directed by Christiana Obwe at 7.20. Please wait for that, because it's actually uh, a top, uh, one of our top programs here. And after that, we do uh, showing Carl the Bakai uh, after uh, at nine o'clock, after we'll have seen uh, the strong beat. Today is for Wale Showing Carl. Thank you very much. The film screen now. I'm out of here. Shrinka is a man much misunderstood, and perhaps that's because he's um, maybe two different kinds of personalities. He's uh, to people who are close to him, very warm, very uh, friendly, very unassuming. For those who don't know him, people whom he's not close to, he tends to have a different image, um, a standoffish image, uh, somebody who's difficult to get close to. I have a dream. Je fais un rêve. Un jour, le principal souci de l'homme sera de nourrir son esprit. Le temps des grands et petits profits the petits and the grands egoisms seront revolus. Il ne nous restera plus à assouvir que notre fin de compréhension et de culture. Je rêve, mais il faudra bien qu'un jour cela soit. L'homme a vécu dans des cavernes, des huttes, des villages, des pays, des nations, et aujourd'hui, nous prenons conscience d'habiter une planète. Chaque homme est devenu le proche voisin de chaque homme de la planète. Pour cela, il est nécessaire que tout homme ait non seulement les moyens de vivre, mais encore ceux de penser par lui-même, qu'on lui reconnaisse le droit d'accès à la connaissance et aussi celui de cultiver sa propre culture. Car ce n'est pas d'une vision unique dont cette planète a besoin, mais d'un regard riche de toutes les différences, de toutes les aspirations, de tous les souvenirs. When I left uh, the University of Ife, where I was teaching in 1985, of course, I had to 
have somewhere to put my head. So I began uh, thinking of um, a small place in my old uh, town, Abeokuta. As the construction went on, I thought of uh, expanding it and making it a kind of uh, artist's retreat. <laughs> There is a bit of bush around, but we are not really far from Abeokuta. In fact, this is part of Abeokuta. But I have picked one of the uh, most extreme points of the town because the whole idea is to get away from everything and everybody, but while at the same time keeping physical touch with the rest of the town. So it is in Abeokuta, yes. Abeokuta was a city of rocks, still is, rocks and... Uh, woods interspersed with rocks. So the rocks were the predominant kind of nature image in Abeokuta. I was born here, brought up in Ake. Ake is almost, well, not quite on the other side. From here, it's about halfway through the town of Abeokuta. That's where I was raised. Well, it's where it all began. These are the playgrounds of uh, one's childhood, all this area. Uh, they used to have uh, whitewashed stones, but um, all that seems to have changed. It's all bare. Um, it's impossible to see now because it's been demolished. But the pastor whom I described, the canon whom I described in Ake, his house used to be over there, uh, but the prelate's domain was that uh, church over there, St. Peter's Church. Now, this is the primary school where I spent uh, most of the time. It's the school bell, one of my favorite characters. In my conception, it is always related to that church. In fact, I think I described it in Ake as the infant son, infant child of that very distant parent. Um, the whole place was like a family, both the animate objects and the inanimate objects, including even these playing fields, which have changed now. Now that, of course, was the dominant object uh, in the entire compound. That mass of boulders was the, was the boss of everything. It dominated the entire space here. It was patriarch and matriarch for all the children. Playground, all the hollows, the cones, climbing on the uh, backs of the rocks, trying to be as sure-footed as those goats over there. Now this, of course, is Jonas. If you haven't guessed, and if you've read uh, Ake, The Years of Childhood, the whale, I know it was a whale who swallowed uh, the prophet Jonah, but in, our, in my view at the time, this was the whale, Jonah. And uh, it's, somebody's been chopping off the head, some nasty people, but uh, it still retains the same shape. Uh, the main attraction was its placidity. One could just lie on the back all day. I was fascinated by the oval pools. Who made them? We didn't know, but who must have come from uh, somewhere in the skies and just dug out these holes, especially for us to knead clay in. This building, that's where I started my schooling, the infant section of St. Peter's School. I followed my sister to school uh, <clears throat> very early, before I was even three. And uh, according to my teacher, who enjoys telling the story, that's where I signaled my intention to soak up all possible knowledge by soaking all his books in my pee. I had fallen asleep on his table. Anyway, after that very uh, determined signal to the world, the teacher had no option but to let me stay on and continue my schooling with um, other children who were Far older than I was, the classes were not demarcated by any walls, just different classes grouped there in that alcove over there. Occasionally, a mat partition, and that is all. So you had a uh, times table ringing here, you have a uh, Bible recitation ringing over there, you have uh, maybe some hygienic class over there, and then you have the usual squalling and fighting among children, all of it, everything together. And, uh, Somehow, things did get learned. In Ake, I tried to reconstruct everything through my eyes as a child. Ishara is my paternal uh, village. It used to be a village, now it's a town, a small town. 
uh, it's a very different, uh, very different earth from Ake, my first childhood uh, biography. In fact, uh, Ishara was, uh, in a sense, created by Ake after I tried to recapture, to retrieve that portion of my existence which has vanished or which is vanishing. I, um, I found my thoughts turning more and more to Ishara. Ishara is um, part of my childhood, except that I do not appear in it. It really is more the, the story, I call it, I describe it a voyage around essay, essay being my father. Um, a title I borrowed, a subtitle I borrowed from John Mortimer's play, which he wrote about his father. But I like very much the sound of it, a voyage around one's father. So it doesn't pretend to be totally factual, but it, it's based on facts, uh, the real names there. Uh, I tried now to approach that period, and especially the town of Ishara, with uh, far more mature sensibility. This time I tried to listen to the voices which they used among themselves, to recollect those voices, that perspective on life, on politics, the colonial period, which is very important to them. I didn't realize what colonialism was when I was that young. All I knew was that we dressed up in our little starched shorts and shirts and marched to, on Empire Day. And unknowing uh, to ourselves, we sang very proudly, not knowing that we were laughing at ourselves, we sang the praises of Queen Victoria and how she was the great 